G'day, I'm Gary Stevens, and welcome to the third season of the History in the Bible podcast. In this final season, I explore how the Jews and the Christians constructed new religions when they were sent spinning into the void after the destruction of the temple. All of the history about all of the books beyond the Bible. Episode 3.17 Quest for the Rabbis Part 2 The Mishnah In the last episode, I began a tentative exploration of the origin of the rabbis. Let's take a closer look at their first great product, the Mishnah. Until the mid-19th century, all the ancient Jewish traditions in the Mishnah and its expansive commentaries, the Talmudim, were taken as, forgive me, gospel. If a Talmud said that Rabbi X had said so and so, why, of course he did. At that point, the brilliant German rabbi Zechariah Frankel launched the modern critical study of the Talmudim, a few years before Julius Wellhausen did the same for the Old Testament or Tanakh. To hear more about Wellhausen's seminal work, hearken way back to my episode 1.7, Writing the Pentateuch. Frankel's project only gained momentum a century later. Today, literary and form criticism of the Mishnah is a booming discipline. To take just one illustration, consider the contention between the early rabbinic houses of Shammai, or Shammai, I've heard both pronunciations, and Hillel, around the turn of the eras, during the time of Herod the Great and his successors. Ah, you really should catch up with Herod's homicidal shenanigans. I have them covered in episode 2.15, The Rise and Ruin of the Maccabeans, and following episodes. Hillel the Elder is one of the earliest sages mentioned in the rabbinic literature, although he's never given the title rabbi. He died when Jesus was a child. Hillel was later acclaimed not so much for his legal scholarship, but his personality and ethics. He was a gentle and tolerant man, compassionate towards the poor, a man who prioritised the spirit over the letter of the law. It is entirely possible that Jesus picked up some of Hillel's ideas, but we can never know for certain. According to tradition, House Hillel was more lenient in its legal interpretations than House Shammai. Here's a simple example. Quote, Mishnah Berakot 8.7 one who ate and forgot, and did not recite a blessing. House of Shammai says, he returns to the place where he ate and recites the blessing. House of Hillel says, that is unnecessary. He recites the blessing at the place where he remembered. End quote. Supposedly, the disciples of the two houses genteely struggled for ascendancy, until the house of Hillel triumphed after the Great Revolt in 67 CE. It is now clear that these struggles were actually those of the rabbis of 150 years later. They used the two houses of Hillel and Shammai, or Shammai as proxies to advance arguments fizzing in their own time. Rabbinic works written centuries later are a brim with stories of the rabbis of the Mishnah. And that's the problem. They were written centuries later. They often read more as salutary folk tales than historical accounts. So let's cast a glance at the inscrutable Mishnah. This became the core of modern rabbinic Judaism. I mentioned in the last episode that the second century CE the formative period of the rabbis and the Mishnah is a dark age bereft of evidence. The Mishnah is the sole substantial Hebrew document from the period that we have. 
everything else is brief inscriptions. This means we have no body of contemporary Hebrew literature that we can use to disentangle thorny linguistic issues. We have a vast amount of contemporary Greek literature that helps us interpret tricky expressions in the Greek New Testament. For the Mishnah, nothing. I do not read Hebrew, and I have barely skimmed the Mishnah. So, as usual, I rely on the labours of others. I am a hobbit travelling on the branches of Ents. In this episode, I rely on the works of Donald Akinson of Queen's University in Ontario and Barry Wimpheimer of Northwestern University in Illinois. I especially commend Baz's free course, the Talmud, A Methodological Introduction. You can catch up with them in the living bibliography on my website, www historyinthebible.com I have not been able to find a date for the oldest Mishnah fragment. The best I can give you is that the oldest fragment of a Talmud, a commentary on the Mishnah, is a floor mosaic in an ancient synagogue in northern Israel, dated to about the year 450. The Mishnah consists of six orders, Sedarim or Sedarim, Again, I hear different pronunciations. Each is divided into tractates. Each tractate discusses a specific legal topic. Each chapter in a tractate considers a particular aspect of that topic. The Mishnah is written in Hebrew in a distinctive, concise style. Legal opinions are stated tersely, often without justification or explanation. Here is just a small passage from this wonderfully argumentative book. On the one side we have Rabbi Meir, an intellect of legendary proportions. I do hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. He lived through the Kitos War and the Bar Kosovo Revolt. He is one of the most cited rabbis in the Mishnah. Against him are opposed the anonymous sages, perhaps an early collective rabbinic or even pharisaic viewpoint from a century earlier. Quote, Mishnah Tractate Avoda Zura 2.5 oh, So many names I have difficulty pronouncing in this episode. Uh, the book means roughly strange worship or idolatry. The skin bottles of Gentiles that are filled with the wine of an Israelite are forbidden, and it is forbidden to have any benefit from them. So Rabbi may ear. But the sages say, it is not forbidden to have any benefit from them. The grape skins of the Gentiles are forbidden, and it is forbidden to have any benefit from them. So Rabbi Meir. But the sages say, when moist they are forbidden, but when dried they are permitted. The Bithynian cheese of the Gentiles is forbidden. So Rabbi Meir. But the sages say, it is not forbidden to have any benefit from them. End quote. I'm dying to find out what Bithynian cheese is. Like feta? Like halloumi? Like saganaki? The Mishnah rarely indicates which opinion is correct. You have to make up your own mind. The Mishnah embraces diversity and difference. Christians took the exact opposite tack, insisting that there was one truth and one doctrine to be imposed on all by the bishops. The Mishnah invented a uniquely Jewish way of argumentation, full of wry humour and exasperation. Every disagreement could be politely but logically countered. In a rare moment of self-reflection, the Mishnah explains why minority opinions are included with majority opinions. This passage cites Rabbi Judah Hanasi, who lived two centuries after the contention between the houses of Hillel and Shammai. Quote, Mishnah Tractate Eduot, 1-3, Testimonies. And why do they record the opinions of Shammai and Hillel for naught? To teach the following generations that a man should not always persist in his opinion. For behold, 
the fathers of the world did not persist in their opinion. And why do they record the opinion of a single person among the many, when the law must be according to the opinion of the many? So that if a court prefers the opinion of the single person, it may depend on him. For no court may set aside the decision of another court, unless it is greater than it in wisdom and in number. Rabbi Yehuda said, If so, why do they record the opinion of a single person among the many to set it aside? So that if a man shall say, Thus have I received the tradition, it may be said to him, According to the refuted opinion of that individual, did you hear it? End quote. The Mishnah rarely cites the Tanakh, Old Testament. The Mishnah keeps its distance from Scripture. Later rabbis puzzled over the Mishnah's relationship to Holy Writ. The Mishnah's tractate Pirkei Avot, Chapters of the Fathers, asserts that the sages' authority is independent of Scriptures. What the sages say is the law, is the law, and that is that. The opposite tack was taken by Sifra, book, a commentary of Leviticus, written not long after the Mishnah. Sifra believes that the Mishnah only makes sense as a restatement of scripture. Later rabbis decided that every statement in the Mishnah, derived from some biblical passage, or emerged as a reasonable consequence of biblical law. They spent centuries correcting the Mishnah's aggravating lack of scriptural proof texts to produce the vast commentaries known as the Talmudim. These perpetually ask, from where do we derive this? The Mishnah has a stouter and dowdier sister, the Tosefta, or Tosefta. Yet again, I keep hearing different pronunciations. Both seem to have been codified around the same time. The Tosefta is a rambling work, three times longer than the Mishnah. And believe me, the Mishnah is no easy walk in the meadows. The Tosefta is usually seen as a commentary on the more obscure Mishnah passages. Many modern scholars believe that the Tosefta often preserves older traditions, derived from an earlier tradition that both works drew upon. The Mishnah and the Tosefta are extraordinary because they appear from nowhere. They are sui generis. Their only possible predecessor is the brief and obscure Seder Olam Rabbah, the great order of the world. This is attributed to one Rabbi Yose ben Halafna, a sage often mentioned in the Mishnah. The two tomes mark a radical departure from older Jewish religious works in several ways. The Mishnah and the Tosefta comprise a form of literature unknown to the Tanakh. They abandon the historical narrative form of Genesis, Exodus, Joshua Judges, Samuel, Kings and Chronicles. These historical writings are cited only a few dozen times, where those historical books take pains to locate people in history. The Mishnah and the Tosefta just don't care. The two tomes give us no psalms, or songs, or prayers, or laments. No romances, like Ruth. No philosophy, like Ecclesiastes, Kohelas. No theology, like Job. They make no prophecies. Nor do the tomes bear the least resemblance to the copious apocalyptic works written during the Second Temple Period after the canon of the Tanakh was closed. The Mishnah and Tosefta have no truck with their fantastical imagery and their expectations of God's liberating royal and priestly messiahs. The fantastical elements of the Second Temple literature would only re-emerge in Judaism many centuries later in the Jewish palace and chariot literature. For more on that literature, grab yourself a battered salve to munch on. And to rewind to episode 2.1 in Babylon Part 1, The Exile. Most Second Temple books claim they are written by a figure of old, such as Enoch, who receives new revelations 
direct from God or his angels. The Mishnah is resolutely anonymous. It never claims divine inspiration and insists it is age old. The apocalyptic books are often written in a style mimicking biblical Hebrew. The Mishnah makes no attempt to recreate the Hebrew of centuries before and invents its own terse character. Half of the Mishnah is dedicated to the temple and its rituals. Yet as Donald Akinson points out, the Mishnah shows no nostalgia for the temple and no bitterness over its destruction. The Mishnah has no desire to bring back the priests, the sacrifices, and the Levites. The rabbis were prepared for a religion outside the temple establishment, an institution they were at best sceptical of and often downright hostile to. The rabbis subtly moved the temple's practices into the courts, the academies, and the home. Every household became a surrogate temple. The guardians of purity were no more the priests, long gone, but the women of the household. Upon women now devolved the sacred duty of preserving the sanctity of the home, and especially of food. The burdens of purity once laid upon the priests now fell on the shoulders of women. The Mishnah regulates their entire life course, from infancy to fertility, to marriage, to widowhood. The later rabbis also redefined the idea of a holy war, or commanded war. Joshua waged a divinely commanded war against the Canaanites. The Maccabeans waged a commanded war against the Seleucids. To refresh yourselves about those, revisit my episodes 1.25, Joshua conquers Canaan, and 2.15, The Rise and Ruin of the Maccabeans. With the abysmal failure of the three revolts against the Romans, the rabbis neutered the concept of holy war. The rabbis decided that God had established a compact between Jews and Gentiles to protect the people. As long as the Jews refrained from defying their overlords, God would ensure that the Gentiles would keep their part of the deal and not persecute Jews. That worked just fine until the Christians gained control of the levers of Roman power in the late 4th century. The Mishnah cites about 120 sages. In a Jewish tradition, they are called the Tanaim, or Tanaim. Yet again, I keep hearing different pronunciations. People, I try my best. This is as good as I can I have a great chart of the leading Tanayim on my website. They are the foundational exponents of the oral law. Rabbinic literature, written many centuries later, wove dozens of stories around them. At the heart of the Mishnah is Rabbi Akiva ben Yosef, who flourished in the decades before the Bar Kosovo revolt in the early 2nd century. Few of the early rabbis are held in higher esteem than Rabbi Akiva. If tradition is right, he must have been in his 80s at the time of the Bar Kosovo revolt. The stories go that he was a rural hick who came to Torah study at the age of 40. In Akiva's time, most people were dead by 35. His long-suffering wife, daughter of a wealthy man, supported Akiva through his decades of study. Our earliest stories about Akiva do not give his wife the dignity of a name. Ah, so typical of patriarchal societies. Akiva founded an academy in the little town of Yavne, the colony that the scribes and scholars had established after the fall of the temple, located not far from the Mediterranean coast. The town was 50 kilometres or 31 miles northwest of Jerusalem. To refresh yourself on Yavne, rewind to episode 3.7, after the Temple Part 1, the Judeans. Akiva sat on the Sanhedrin. His students' later stories held, numbered in their tens of thousands. Tradition holds that Akiva was the first to collect the oral teachings of the scattered rabbinic circles into some sort of order that made them easier to memorise and to transmit to future generations. 
Before his time, each rabbi had contacts with only a small number of colleagues and only a partial awareness of other rabbis. Akiva is renowned as the very heart of the Mishnah. Most of the sages quoted in its pages are Akiva's first or second generation disciples. Their labours would establish rabbinic Judaism as normative Judaism. They extinguished the competing claims of the Sadducees, the Zealots, the Essenes and the apocalyptic sects. While the later sages lauded Akiva's role in the preservation of the oral law, they were loath to mention that Rabbi Akiva believed fervently that Shimon bar Kosiva was the Messiah who would liberate the Judeans from Rome. Akiva could not have been the only rabbinic supporter that Shimon had. Much later rabbinic works report his contemporaries were sceptical. In this passage from the Talmud, a rabbi plays on Shimon bar Kosovo's nickname, bar Kokva, son of a star. Talmud Tractate Tarnat, 4.6 Rabbi Shimon bar Yachai taught, Akiva, my master, used to interpret a star goes forth from Jacob, as a Kokva goes forth from Jacob. Rabbi Akiva, when he saw bar Kokva, said, This is the King Messiah. Rabbi Yohanan ben Torta said to him, Akiva, grass will grow on your cheeks, and still the son of David does not come. End quote. Akiva's martyrdom is one of the most moving stories told in the much later work, the Babylonian Talmud. Quote, Talmud Tractate Berakot, 61b. The sages taught, One time, after the Bar Kosovar rebellion, the evil empire of Rome decreed that Israel may not engage in the study and practice of Torah. A rabbi came and found Rabbi Akiva, who was convening assemblies in public and engaging in Torah study. The rabbi said to him, Akiva, are you not afraid of the empire? Akiva said, We Jews, now that we sit and engage in Torah study, we fear the empire to this extent. If we proceed to sit idle from its study, as its abandonment is the habitat that causes our death, all the more so we will fear the empire. The sages said, not a few days passed until they seized Rabbi Akiva and incarcerated him. When they took Rabbi Akiva out to be executed, it was time for the recitation of Shema, and they were raking his flesh with iron combs, and he was reciting Shema. His students said to him, Our teacher, even now, as you suffer, you recite Shema. He said to them, All my days I have been troubled by the verse, with all your soul. Meaning, even if God takes your soul. I said to myself, When will the opportunity be afforded me to fulfil this verse? Now that it has been afforded me, shall I not fulfil it? The ministering angels said before the Holy One, Blessed be he. And then a divine voice emerged and hit said, Happy are you, Rabbi Akiva, as you are destined for life in the world to come, as your portion is already in eternal life. End quote. We have little reason to doubt Akiva's martyrdom, but we are right to be sceptical about the motives behind it. The rabbis believed that Akiva died because he persisted in teaching the law. The Romans never instituted a ban on teaching the law, as the history of the later rabbis well attests. The rabbis were deeply reluctant to accept that one of their greatest had a role to play in the calamity of the Bar Kosovo revolt. The real story, surely, is that Akiva died not because of his piety, but for his support of an enemy of Rome. Along with many other towns in Judea, Akiva's sanctuary of Yavne was devastated during Bar Kosovar's revolt. The little group of well-to-do scholars abandoned their academy and followed the exodus to Galilee, a region untouched by the rebellion. In the decades after Akiva's death, the loosely connected rabbinic network worked 
to crystallise the scattered traditions of the oral law into the Mishnah. A weighty Jewish tradition holds that the final compiler and redactor of the Mishnah was Yehuda Hanasi, Judah the Prince. Yehuda Hanasi was yet another fruit of the tangled tree that was the house of Hillel and Gamaliel. Romance is held that he was born on the day that Rabbi Akiva died. Perhaps the patriarch completed his labours around the year 200. He was well known to the Christian father, Saint Jerome of all people, who lived 150 years after Yehuda Hanasi. The prince was a busy man. He was not only a great scholar, but the civic leader of the large refugee Jewish community in Galilee. He was the first Nasi, or patriarch or prince, to have his title incorporated into his name. Yehuda Hanasi built on the efforts of rabbis long dead, most especially Akiva and his students. In the Mishnah, Yehuda Hanasi prefaced his own opinions with the bland Rabbi says, an anonymous reference that by its anonymity claims a higher authority. Still, he always admitted divergent opinions and traditions and he recognised that he stood on the shoulders of giants. In the next episode, I explore the impact of the revolts on the Christians when they came under the Roman gaze. Thanks for visiting. For show notes, maps, charts and timelines, visit my website at www.historyinthebible.com you can even download professional posters for free.